we can give those back. So we need to give those back to them. Is that the idea? Yeah, they'll be giving us a different key. Okay. We're going to get a key to the main building, okay. assuming we go ahead with our current plan. Well, I'm keen to uh, start meeting it back in person again. So, yeah, well, we'll see if we can keep get this. me in the loop. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if we can get this tech stuff to work. And what do you yeah, think guess... about the two monitor idea? Think we can make that work? Yeah, all we can do is try. Yeah, I've I've noticed that the, a lot of the stuff I just signed up for a course up at UVic, and it's in person, so they're yeah. they're starting to veer away from the online. Well, the goal was pretty much for this winter session to be um, in person, and it hasn't entirely been, but most of it has been. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think from here on in, it's just basically um, making sure people's anxieties are uh, recognized and providing alternatives and yeah. move forward as best we can. Yeah, I think if we can continue to provide the Zoom option, that would be great. So, I mean, there, there there's reasons other than the pandemic for Zoom, so yeah. we need to, we need to recognize that, right? Oh yeah, well, there's quite a few members who don't live that close by, and it's uh, and with the price of fuel, I don't know if people really want to drive around as much. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's another issue. People have formed different habits in the last two years, and uh, yeah. pulling them away from those back to going to meetings and running around madly at seven p.m. like everyone does in our city. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, yet to be seen how much of that comes back. Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, I think we'll see some differences, so it's good. I probably good. come in online. Yeah, well, I mean, it is quite a hike for you, isn't it? I mean, it's... Yeah, so... Well, Fairfield is people. not central, that's the issue. No. I mean, even myself, I mean, it's a, you know, 20 minute drive, and I live on the other side of the city, so I'm relatively close compared to a lot of people but it's quite a drive <laughs> down well, there and back if you're going to do it online though i think we're going to need some kind of a certificate of proof that you're actually three-dimensional <laughs> <laughs> how's that going to work <laughs> maybe we need stereo tv or something there we go Jill, the last time I saw you, you had a trumpet in your hand. Really? <laughs> yeah, you too, John. Are you still playing? I did, I did too. That's true. <laughs> we'll have a music night some night. <laughs> yeah. We'll just give it another moment or two. I see quite a few people signing in. Um, just while we're um, getting ready as well. So. Um, so far for speakers tonight, and I'm just looking around to make sure everybody's here. I've got Margie and Jeff and John and Nathan, uh, David Lee, Lori, and Dave, we've got some Edmonton photos. Does anybody else have anything or if I miss anybody? If we're bored, I can add something. But oh, well, we'll see. We've got seven people. So. I know. It sounds wonderful. So um well you always get the closing word and if chris gainer has an update we can have something from him too great yes i've got something okay i will put you there and randy to be our anchor lap there or whatever i will do anchor and i will either do it quickly or if everybody takes only two minutes then i can carry on <laughs> very good i see we've got 25 people here so that's great just give it a moment or two longer as we've now reached the end of February, so there we go. Uh, for those people who are just joining us, we are um, 
investigating and hopefully getting a little closer to maybe having some in-person option. So we'll, I'm kind of uh, thinking in my mind, maybe for April, but we'll see how we get on. We've just got to make sure we can get this technical stuff to work. And uh, cause we'd like to continue to offer a Zoom option for uh, Astro Cafe. And we'd need to um, move our TV cause we won't be where we were. Few little details to sort out, but we're getting closer. Where are you going to be, Chris? Um, so I don't know if you kind of know the facility there, but right behind the portable, there's an addition to the building that was the, that is their youth center. Okay. So it's immediate. It's, it's effectively in exactly almost exactly the same place. It's just it's in the main building. All right. So Ground so floor. That's the very lowest floor of the main building. So where, just where just to back just to back up again for people who. This is two years since we've been there, so. Yes, this is um, <laughs> Sir James Douglas School is down in Fairfield and behind the school is uh, Fairfield Gonzalez Community Association. Uh, their official address is on Fairfield Road, actually. But we meet, uh, have met at a portable behind the main building. And uh, we're looking at an alternate room in the same area and using, um, Fairfield Gonzalez Association as the landlord again. So, yeah, the, the main reason issue with the portable has been that it's now got a full day program, and it's there. They would rather not rent that space out, so they've gradually moved. Um, we we were down to the last people still using it as a an external client. So, and the people who were there might remember that if they didn't remember to bring us chairs that's a daycare. So um, the furniture was rather small. <laughs> yeah, we, were, we, 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 were did, on, we did attempt to use the chairs, though. We, we were, were on baby chairs for one night. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it's pretty full of stuff. And they've, in fact, added more stuff in the past two years because it's uh, more stuff going on. So that uh, that space is pretty full. So it uh, doesn't really work very well. So what they instead they've offered us is um, they have a youth drop-in center that's used um, most afternoons and um, uh, one evening a week, but we can certainly keep Monday. Um, they offered us additional space in um, the facility or options of other space in the facility, but we would have to change to either Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. And I'm not thinking that that's probably not those are probably not great nights, especially as we try and do things on the hill Friday or Saturday, and then you know that just left Sunday. So, so we're thinking we try the youth center space and see how that works. Anyways, well, there's 27 people here tonight. Um, so just to run through the speaker order again. Um, so now I have Margie. Uh, you'll be first, and then Jeff, and then John has some photos for us. Uh, Nathan. Uh, David, Lori, uh, Dave uh, with Edmonton Photos, uh, Chris Gaynor, and Randy to finish. Is it, does anybody else have anything for this evening? Oh, no, uh, quick, Chris, Chris, I'll just finish up with an announcement with SIGs near the end. Okay. And Bill Weir, did you have something? Yeah, it will only take about a minute. Okay, I'll put you in right before Randy so you can be the... Uh, We'll bump Randy down one and Randy and then David with SIGs for the week. Okay, Bill. Okay, very good. Margie, are you ready? Now that you have internet tonight. <laughs> uh, you're muted still too. Yes, I, I, um, you may remember, was it two weeks ago, Margie was here and everything was going well and then her inter internet collapsed for some strange outage outage there and it seemed to be in the area too because I remember Randy was cutting in and out a bit that night and I think you guys live in a similar area of the city but uh, tonight it's all looking good so all right please take it go. away um I'm going to share the screen And then I move participants away.
and you'll just need to drag your display window. Um, we're seeing your Zoom at the moment, so. so maybe you can show us as a keynote you're using, I think. All right, so I move the participants away. Um, uh, it says your internet connection is unstable. Hmm. Oh, spoke too soon, sorry. <laughs> All right, do you see my screen? Well, we can see your desktop, but not keynote yet. All right. We've got a picture with the uh, moon and some nice stars and looks like the uh, earth there. I can't tell you which part. Ah, and there, yeah, you've highlighted it on your bar, but it's not on the screen yet. Ah, now it's coming up. Seems to take a moment, doesn't it? There it is. Yeah, now we've got it. All right, that's good. There we go. All right. Uh, the person I am uh, speaking about tonight is Lisa Dang. She is a PhD student. She is 28 years old, which just blows me away. She is of Vietnamese heritage, and she is a PhD student in physics at McGill. Margie, we lost, oh, there it's coming back. Okay, I was gonna say it vanished. Oh no, it's right. back. It's back again. It's back, yeah, thanks. That's good, all yeah. right. Vanished again. And it vanished. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened there, but it vanished again. It keeps no. or yeah, it keeps minimizing, so it keeps going back to the uh, bar there. Oh gracious! I'm not sure why. I wonder if I changed places. All right, maybe I should. It, can you see that? Uh, we're still looking at the background at the moment, so we can't see the slide. We can't see keynote. All right. How about I just? I'm wondering if I should change location. Let's just see if that makes any difference. All right. I have changed locations. Um, and there it's back again. Yeah, that looks better. Now let's hope it stays there. Yeah, and you know what? I what I did was I minimized it, so now you can see it and I can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. we can. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try to press play, play and see if it makes it larger. Is it still there? disappeared yeah that's what oh now yeah and that's when it seems to vanish but just give it a second now it's there good i think it just takes a moment to catch up so can you see that margie yourself can you see it yourself i can see i can it's on play and i can see it can you, you see it you, you you can just if, if it doesn't work full size just leave it and then you we can still see it yes that's true so, and then you can then you can read it as well that's true. Can you read it now? Can you yes. see it now? It is full size though. Can you read it? I can. Oh, okay. Then we're good. So let me know if anything happens to it. All right. So this is Lisa Dang, <coughs> PhD student, age 28, Vietnamese heritage. She is a PhD student in physics at McGill University. Uh, she wasn't even born when the planning for the James Webb Space Telescope began. And her research uh, is in an area which didn't exist at that time. She re her research focuses on the characterization of hot Jupiter's atmospheres. Hot Jupiters are gas giant planets with very short orbital periods, for example, less than 10 days. These giant exoplanets are a place to test atmospheric theories in extreme environments. Because extreme, because the hot Jupiter is very, very hot on one side and very, very cold on the other. She is interested in hot Jupiters whose emission spectra are poorly fitted to known spectral models. 
she will be amongst the first principal investigators to use the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, 1,200 telescope time proposals from 44 countries were submitted to NASA in November 2020 to receive access to the James Webb Space Telescope in its first year of operation. Of those 1,200 proposals, 286 were chosen as part of the GO program, the General Observation Program. This is for and this is for the, for the first year. And of those 286, only 10 of those have Canadians as principal investigators. Lisa will map the atmosphere and the surface of hot Jupiter lava planet K2141b, which closely orbits its star. And this planet is 202 light years away in the direction of Aquarius. Due to the planet's proximity to its star, it is likely to have molten rock surface and rock vapor atmosphere. It's a place where it might rain liquid rock and snow rock particles. Lisa and her team will use the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument, to observe radiation from 5 to 28 microns. Uh, she and her team will collect 25 hours of data. She is devoted to making science available to everyone through presentations, outreach programs, and connections to industry through physics. This is what blew me away. She is 28. And I was going to, I was going to just use her her bio and put it on put it on a slide, but it took three pages. So here it is in a nutshell. Professional experiences seven, successful observation observing proposals and research grants eight, selected awards and re recognitions eight, student research advising. Three, selected outreach and science communication roles, six. Teaching roles, 10. Services and committees, five. Public talks and panels, nine. Selected media coverages, which includes podcasts, videos, and news articles, 17. Scientific talks and posters, 30. Professional workshops, five. She's done that all. And she's 28 years of age. That's it. Well, thank you for sharing that and finding her. So she's uh, done a lot already. <laughs> Maybe once uh, things are up and running, we could uh, see if she'd uh, come and talk to us too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great. Well, thank you again. Any questions for Margie? And so if not, Jeff, are you ready? I'm all set. Okay, you may take it away. Okay. Good. Can you see the screen here? Mm -hmm. Yes. And enlarge now? Everybody's got that? Do you hear me? Is, is it okay? Kind of an odd looking screen, but we see it. <laughs> yeah, just a little text box in the center. Is that that's the, it? the text box in the center was was the start? Yeah. Just yeah. For me. So we're right there. Yeah. That's okay, good. good. So so I ended up in Toronto last weekend, uh, and it was in the Eastern Time Zone. And I noticed on the uh, Rask um, newsletter that there was a talk coming out of Montreal. So I, um, it sounded interesting. It was the anniversary of uh, Perseverance, which is the Mars rover. So I um, um, participated in that. Um, um, it was a public presentation. Uh, and it was interesting enough that I thought the group here would be interested in some of the highlights of the, uh, the anniversary of the Perseverance rover. So it's interesting. This is, this is Margie's second talk. The, the presentation was given by a PhD student uh, at McGill uh, by the name of Aaron Gibbons. 
Um, and I'll talk a little bit of, of, about Erin because her background is really important uh, in terms of what she's been doing with NASA and with the Mars rover. Um, this is, this is uh, uh, Karim Jaffer, who, who does the public outreach uh, at the, uh, the Montreal. Um, are you able to see my pointer as I, as I move it? Because it will be helpful with some of the other stuff. Great. Okay. Okay. So this is Karim Jaffer. He introduced um, um, Aaron. Um, Aaron is a PhD candidate at uh, McGill. She is a bright gal, a very engaging speaker, very, very interested in the work she's doing. She's a 2020 Vanier Scholarship um, um, winner. Uh, Vanier Scholarship uh, funds three years of research for PhD candidates. She has a background in training in geology, organic geochemistry, and planetary science. She describes her research as being dedicated to enhancing the search for life on Mars by studying the ex extreme tolerant organisms on Earth. So basically she looks at uh, small organisms uh, that, uh, that are thriving near volcanoes and near glaciers and so on. Her eventual goal is to become an astrobiologist. So with this background, she, um, uh, with, with the Mars rover going, she put her name forward to NASA and she was snapped up to work. And this is from NASA now. She works as a pay payload specialist uplink lead for the SuperCam remote sensing instrument, which is a, a big mouthful. Uh, but basically this is a um, um, laser spectrometer that's mounted on top of the uh, mast of the rover. And I'll show you a picture of the rover in a minute. And it's used to analyze the geochemistry of uh, the Mars rock samples looking for signs of life. So it was really the decision of where they went and what's been done that, that made this talk so interesting. So this is the, the Perseverance rover. Uh, the the um, SuperCam, which she's operating uh, or has lead in operating, is at the top of the mast. Um, it uh, shoots a laser and it's a spectrometer so that it can look for um, certain uh, uh, geochemical signal signals. Um, the Mars rover has a number of other experiments, but the major portion or the major intent of uh, the, Mar <clears throat> the Mars rover Perseverance was to look for signs of life. Actually, there's, there's, there's four goals that they outlined. Um, first and, and foremost was uh, determining wh whether life ever existed on Mars. Secondly, characterizing, characterizing the climate of Mars. Thirdly, characterizing the geology of Mars. And fourthly, preparing for human exploration. Um, the presentation that she gave was on February the 19th. The anniversary of a Perseverance landing on Mars was uh, February the 18th. It landed on February the 18th, um, 2021. Her, her talk really broke down into three different areas, and I'll try to touch on them. Firstly, and, and importantly, and, and interestingly, the evidence that led to this Mars mission, why search for life uh, at this time on Mars, and why this location? Um, there are some mission findings to date, and uh, she just touched on the, the proposed future of this, this mission. Um, so the slides that, that I have are from the presentation. I do have assurance that they're all for public, they're all in the public domain. So there's, there's no issues with, uh, with showing and, and uh, sharing it. So the Mars rover quickly breaks down into these, the super cam on top and the mass cam, which is really basically for visualizing direction. Uh, the, the rover is, is because of the distance uh, to Mars, which is about a four minute radio delay. It's, it's basically autonomous um, uh, and they can program it having scouted the, the direction, but it's, it's operating autonomously. Um, so other experiments are on the arm uh, that includes Sherlock, which we'll touch on. Uh, and the, the drills and the components to get the rock samples. MOXIE is an interesting um, separate experiment uh, looking at um, isolating oxygen in the environment. And then there's, there's a subsurface radar looking at the, uh, the, the uh, subsurface geology. Uh, this is NASA's release, again, uh, reiterating that the, the major goal of the mission is to seek signs of ancient life and collect samples of rocks for possible return to Earth. There was actually a fifth um, component to, to the Perseverance rover. And you're probably aware of the, the Mars helicopter or the autonomous drone that flew. It was actually scheduled to, to do five proof of concept missions and it certainly succeeded wildly in that. They, this, they then seconded it to, to help with the rover's actual operation. So it's, it's scouting routes and paths that the, that the rover will follow and they can then program 
the, the rover's path for the, for the day's travel. Um, this, this is ingenuity, and as I say, it, it uh, succeed, succeeded wildly, and, um, and they're using that now. Uh, the, uh, Aaron's comment, interestingly, was the, it looks like they will try to um, um, include um, autonomous flying vehicles as part of any further rovers because it seems really helpful in terms of mapping the distance and the direction that they're going to be going. So to date, there's been a bunch of other rovers uh, on Mars. Um, there's been exploration in various places of Mars, and there's been no evidence of life uh, identified with any of the rovers. To understand why they Uh, coming from the dust cloud that surrounded the, the forming sun. Um, life sort of trundled along both Earth and Mars forming about the same time. The first traces of life on Earth um, were are, are, are identified about three and a half billion years ago. And that time frame becomes really important for the for the things that, that they're doing. So three and a half billion years ago, we have evidence on Earth of uh, stromatolites, and stromatolites are the fossilized remains of very primitive unicellular or single cell organisms. This is an example of a stromatolite from uh, Australia, and it's dated about three and a half billion years ago. It looks, it looks almost like sedimentary rock, but it's, it's dirt um, glued together by layers of, um, of uh, organic material thought to, thought to arise from the, from the unicellular organisms. So um, Earth and Mars formed about um, four and a half billion years ago, and about three and a half billion years ago, um, they both started off as warm and wet worlds. And about three and a half billion years ago, something changed and Mars went a different direction. Mars became hot and dry. Um, there, is, there is various debate about that, but the, the leading theory now is that because of its smaller size, Mars wasn't able to maintain the magnetic field. With loss of magnetic field, solar radiation swept away the, the um, um, atmosphere. And with the loss of atmosphere, any of the uh, water there froze and then sublimated away. So just confirmation, of course, Mars is a dry and very cold uh, environment right now. This is, this is one of the pictures from the cam. The other thing that's necessary for life, besides being 3.5 billion years ago uh, and, and having um, a sort of warmth, is the presence of water. And there certainly is abundance, abundance of, of evidence that there was water on, on Mars. Um, if you compare uh, pictures of Mars and Earth um, uh, pictures, um, you certainly see evidence of ancient rivers, similar to Earth rivers, and you see evidence of tributaries flowing into major rivers as you do on Earth. So after about five years of debate, the, the um, rover team decided to land Perseverance at the west side of the Jezero Crater. The Jezero Crater is an old crater dating about 3.5 billion years ago, so around the time that Mars lost its, its, um, uh, its environment actually 4 billion years ago, I see from the note here. So um, just before Mars lost its, lost its environment. And the other interesting thing about it was there's presence on the west side of water flow into the crater. And when they looked closer at the crater, it looked there was evidence that the crater had actually been full of water, which spilled over the eastern edge. So it looked to be a, a crater where there, there had been water. More than that, when they looked more carefully at the western edge of it, there was, looked, there was what looked to be a delta forming just where the, the ancient river flowed into the, the crater. Um, we know from Earth that deltas form where fast moving rivers enter more still and larger bodies of water. So think Mississippi Delta or Nile Delta. Um, so th there was a delta-like formation. The other thing for biologists is that deltas are places where any organic material in the river system carried down will deposit because when the, when the river flow slows down, 
the material in the in the river that's been carried by the river precipitates out. So looking for fossils is uh, delta areas is a good bet. The the um, crater itself is about uh, about forty five to fifty kilometers in diameter. Perseverance put down where they where they wanted it to, about two kilometers from the edge of the of the delta. When they got there, they really needed to confirm that their impression from satellites was actually true, and this was a delta. So they looked back at the camera and certainly saw what looked to be delta-like structure. And then they, when they zoomed in, they were more convinced that this was delta-like structure. It had the same um, characteristics of deltas that we have on Earth. There's a slightly sloping top, there is a sloping middle with some debris, with some debris fields from precipitation, and then there's there's a bottom with with debris field as well. They then turned to look at the surface where they landed and scraped away some of the dust and using the arm, um, looked at the rock underneath the the surface layer of dust, and they they saw um, sort of crystalline intrusion in the rock. And this type of formation is often found in igneous rock, a rock from, from volcanic origin. Um, when they looked closer with the, with the SuperCan, they used the laser spectrometer, they actually found traces of minerals, olivine and peroxine, which uh, Aaron tells us uh, is characteristic also of igneous rock that, slow, that has cooled slowly. So it looks like the floor of the, floor of the crater was uh, volcanic in origin. The um, other instrument on the arm called Sherlock was specifically designed to look for traces of carbon uh, in the rock sample. Um, it did find it. Uh, what it can't differentiate is whether the carbon that it, it identified was organic um, or inorganic. Uh, carbon for life on Earth, of course, is, is essential. So it's there, it's a puzzle. They'll take samples and uh, look to see what the nature of the carbon is at some point in the future. So this is, in fact, the drill that they used on the arm. It, um, the, 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 um, um, well, it, it drills in, into the rocks and uh, collects the samples and, and then deposits them in the rover. Uh, this was their first test of concept. They obviously uh, verified that they were drilling in. And when they look down at the sample that was taken, they do have a rock sample. These are packaged uh, in the rover and they're, they're, uh, they're stored for future collection. The, the other experiment that they ran was MOXIE, which was that little bit on the bottom of the rover. MOXIE is, is a, um, a setup to try to abstract oxygen from the Martian uh, carbon dioxide environment. Uh, it was successful. Basically, it heats the carbon dioxide to uh, 800 degrees, breaking down the molecular structure and liberating the oxygen. They collected a significant amount of oxygen as, is, uh, as a proof of concept to just see if it could be done. So they're traveling along, they can travel, um, well, the, the, the rover actually travels up to 100 meters an hour, but they're certainly not uh, trying to gun it at anything like that uh, with the, the rough surface and the, the autonomous nature of the, um, of the rover. Uh, they wanna make sure accidents don't happen, but they've done up to three, 300 meters in a day. Um, the landing site was here. As I said, it's a it's, uh, couple, couple kilometers from the, the delta. They are taking a circuitous route to get to the, to the delta. Um, and that's really because the intervening structure here is thought to be sand, uh, sand dune. And uh, they, they don't want to risk um, um, getting it stuck in, in sand. So they'll be following a, a, a longer but more rocky route to get to the base of the delta, where, which is where they really want to start doing the rock samples to see if they can determine uh, if they can if they can determine any presence of um, uh, ancient uh, fossilized life. Um, the um, current current present uh, current uh, location of the rover as of the 18th of the the one year anniversary was where the where the star is. Uh, they expect to, to arrive at the Delta sometime this spring. Um, proposal for collecting the samples. Uh, certainly the Perseverance rover will have the samples uh, on board. At some point uh, in the next decade, they, they anticipate uh, landing a fetch rover, which will collect those samples, 
take it to a small rocket, which will which will take it back to Mars orbit and then be sent uh, back to Earth. So that's a quick summary of her presentation. It was an excellent presentation. Anything that uh, wasn't clear in my presentation was because of me, not because of uh, because of Erin. Um, she did give me the YouTube um, uh, location for the presentation. So if anybody's interested, I'll post this in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, does anybody do anybody anybody have any questions? So again, maybe a potential speaker for the future, but yes, go ahead. Uh, so the crater was volcanic and is obviously um, older than the river that that fed into it. I'm just surprised, like, do you often see volcanic craters at the bottom of tributaries? I would have thought that volcanic activity would be an uplift sort of thing. It, it's just confusing the geology to me. I think I think it's confusing to everybody. They were actually expecting when they looked at it that the that the the rock may be sedimentary rather than igneous. Um, it's interesting you say that because they they felt that that the warm wet uh, early billion years probably had to do with multiple impacts. So whether that warmth you know led to a molten core and whether there was volcanic activity. Which, which then was flattened by the impact of a crater is, is you know, an, interesting, an interesting thought. Like, uh, and you know, your, your, perplex, um, your perplexity about it is, I think, shared by everybody there. And I think that's what they're looking for in terms of you know, what's coming. But I, I, agree, I agree with you. I mean, it looks very much like um, you know, igneous rock, which is flattened, and then water flowed into it. So you know, at some point, quite an active uh, environment. Sometimes uh, with the impact craters, what they'll do is they'll actually fracture the crust uh, enough that uh, the uh, uh, molten rock from underneath in the mantle uh, will flow up uh, into the area. So that whether there's a, uh, there could either be a, a source of molten rock, uh, which would uh, look like the igneous rock uh, generated from the heat of impact, or uh, sometimes it flows up uh, through the, um, the fractures that are generated by the impact structure. You know, it's interesting you say that because it reminds me that that Aaron did did mention that they wondered whether the the lake before it was filled with water was actually a lava lake, and that would certainly uh, go along with what you said. Yeah. Is there any was there any mention of the fact that Earth experienced the uh, what was it the uh, the moon the uh, asteroid that crashed into the earth at its early formation it's been hypothesized that that broke up the first crust and then the crust that's been studied that we know was the second crust and not as radioactive as radioactive as the first one would have been which would have enabled life perhaps to start sooner on earth than one might have expected if we hadn't been perhaps lucky enough to acquire the moon and the, the early start with a less radioactive um, crust. Is there any mention of that? There wasn't. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a really interesting thought and, and, and um, um, direction, but no, it, Aaron didn't mention any of that. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Jeff, I was curious about uh, some of the experiments and the fact that they found olivine, because what I've understood is olivine is one of the minerals they think they could use for accelerating the degradation of the Earth's global warming. It, they can use it to, to pull CO2 out because it, when it's on a surface, it degrades fast as opposed to being in the molten center. So, and then you mentioned that they... Uh, they were trying to manufacture oxygen. Was there any discussion about the, the intent to maybe try to create a new atmosphere there or something? Or do you know why they were looking at oxygen? And yeah, I think I think well the way Aaron talked about the the Moxie experiment um, was was to fulfill one of the roles, which is looking for human exploration. So it, it looked like it was a proof of concept to see if oxygen could actually be packaged 
from the environment. And obviously packaging it from CO2 is a heck of a lot easier than thinking you have to transport oxygen from earth, you know, for, for, for consumption for, for a settlement there for a period of years. Yeah, but but no, there was no mention of, of the the specific and, and in fact, you know, really just touched on the the, the presence of the of the two minerals, um, you know, characteristic of, of igneous rock. Thank you. So again, um, you know, I will post I will post post the YouTube. Uh, her her talk went for a little bit more than an hour. Um, if you go to the YouTube channel, her talk starts at about ten minutes into the. Uh, into the YouTube recording. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us, Jeff. That sounds uh, it was very interesting and something to follow up on. Um, John, are you? Yeah. Okay. Available? I'll just share my screen. Okay. So. Um, I think most of you probably uh, are aware that, uh, just a minute, I'll get this. Oh, got something in the way here. Just hold on a sec. There. Most of you are aware that uh, I've been living on the top of a building called Ross Place, which has been very nice for, for doing planetary and solar imaging and so on. Uh, things are changing. And uh, this is right outside the patio where I've been doing that. They're starting to put up a crane here for building a new building. And they're refurbishing this old building. It's a heritage building. Right beside us is going to be a building that will kind of go up pretty high and block my view. And on the other side of the building, to the south where I look, there's another building plan that's going to be uh, even higher than our building. So things are changing. But in the meantime, Wendy and I've had kind of an interesting bird's eye view of how they make these cranes that they uh, build buildings with and it, it's been kind of fascinating. So I thought I'd just show you what we've seen. This is just the start where uh, you can see some pieces of the crane being added. And here's another one coming over. They've set up a, quite a big temporary crane to put that in place. And these two rather brave individuals were working on it and uh, they have a platform on the top of each section that they can stand on while they bring over the next section to uh, to attach. And it's been kind of fascinating watching this happening. Uh, even though I'm sad to see a building going up next door, it has certainly been interesting. And it, this is where they're putting up the very top piece that ends up holding the uh, the parts of the crane that stick out to the side. And you can see them just maneuvering it into place here. And then after they got it in, the, one of those uh, riggers went up to the very top to undo the crane so that it could stay in place. Uh, they picked a nice quiet day to do this. Thank goodness there was no, sometimes the wind up here is pretty strong, but they did pick a nice day. Here's the cab going up. And here are the two pieces that will stick out from the side. This is the one that has the counterweight on it. And this is the long boom that has the crane on it. And the first thing they picked up was this one. That's this picture. And I thought when they lifted it, why did they lift it up from a point where it was hanging at an angle? And if you watch the next pictures, you'll see why they did that. They did it so that they could get these uh, stringers together, which they wouldn't have been able to do when it's down in its uh, lowered position. So they got those attached and then the crane lowered things down and, and those ended up holding it. It was kind of neat to watch. And then they lifted this thing up and this was more than neat to watch. This was actually quite 
scary, and I'll show you why in a moment. They got it up quite high like this. Then they started to swing it around and it came right over top of the patio where I have my telescopes, literally over top. <laughs> so that's what it ended up being. And that's when it was totally finished the next day. And this shows you another reason why it's uh, not going to be very nice to do astronomy up here anymore. This is just a twilight view, but this light is far brighter than the moon and much closer. So uh, the light pollution has suddenly gone way up in this place. So as a result of that, uh, I won't be I won't be using that anymore. Uh, whoops. Let's go this way. I'll be going up to the VCO. And I don't know, uh, before I say anything about this, I wasn't able to attend last week. Did uh, This is a picture that Reg and David and I got. Uh, it was a test picture the first time we got everything working uh, with a new camera at the VCO. Did somebody show this last week? No. Have you seen this already? Okay. So this is obviously a picture of the Orion Nebula. And apologies to those who were on the in the astrophotography SIG, you will have seen this. But just to remind people of where we're at, uh, this is an image with the new QHY 600 uh, camera, which has 60 megapixels. Uh, and it's on the 12 and a half inch OGS scope. It, we had the field flattener in place the uh, filter wheel with all the filters that we need to get RGB and L uh, images. And this image was done, it was only 12 minutes on each of the filters. So it's rather amazing that it produced this much detail that quickly. And uh, so we were kind of pleased with this. And the second thing we did, we we tried the camera out in a different mode. Normally, this camera is not one that you would think of as a video camera uh, for uh, lunar and solar work. But you can uh, choose to use just some of the pixels. And this is just a 1200 by 1600 pixel region. In other words, a very small piece of the whole uh, camera sensor looking at the region around Copernicus on the moon. And uh, we did, we took a video. Uh, it, it was slower than a small video camera would be, but nevertheless, even with the seeing, which was rather poor that day, we got a fairly nice picture of a little piece of the moon. So I just thought you might be interested to see those things. And that's basically all that I have to show you. Thank you, John. Okay, Fascinating to see that um, construction of a crane. You know, you see kind of bits of it going together sometimes if you're lucky, but you got to watch the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, we had a bird's eye view. Front it became seat. a little too close at the end. Yeah, that that would have been uh, that would have been a little unnerving. I could I could see that. Uh, any comments or questions for John? And if not, Nathan, are you standing by? But are they going to keep that light on all night? Can and can you complain? Uh, we could complain, uh, but uh, this is part of the reason, a big part of the reason that Wendy and I are now moving. We're going to move out of this place and uh, into a senior's place up at, on Elk Lake Drive. So uh, we won't have a nice patio to do this anymore, but we will be closer to the VCO. So that's a good thing. Well, thank you again. So Nathan. Hello. 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 Are you ready? I am ready. Carry on, please. Okay. So um, 
first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Lori, if she's on or if she's not as well, for getting me in touch with uh, Kareem Jafar because um, we recently collaborated with the Denver Astronomical Society to create a, um, another astronomical organization that will hopefully um, increase the amount of youth interested in astronomy and gain uh, many more youth members for RASC and other organizations too. Um, so our organization is called the Cosmic Generation. And uh, basically our goal as an organization is to uh, share the awesomeness of the universe with aspiring young astronomers around the world. Um, and so on February 13th, we had our first meeting and, um, where Tara, who's Kareem's daughter, um, presented on extremophiles uh, and extraterrestrial life. Um, that, that went pretty well and quite a few people signed on. Our next meeting is planned for March the 13th. Um, and I created a bit of an announcement poster. Um, this is like my, my first attempt at making an announcement poster. I'm co-hosting it with Bella Grant, who's from the Denver Astronomical Society. Um, you guys are a lot better at making announcement posters than I am. This is just my first attempt. Um, and we're hoping that at our next meeting on March 13th, um, we'll be able to get many more youth involved. Um, right now we're just in our uh, outreach phase. So we're hoping to just spread the word as far as we can in preparation for our next meeting. Um, and I suppose we could say, I could say that um, we do have a life, everyone, Part of the cosmic generation <laughs> we do have a life outside of this but we're very enthusiastic about um sharing the uh, awesomeness of space with youth around the world and we're hoping to not necessarily make it a you are small perspective we're hoping to inspire people um youth specifically but i uh, everyone who's interested in astronomy is welcome to attend um and given that We've only been around for a month or two now. There's still uh, a lot more to come. Uh, right now, we just have a small collection of people, but we're hoping to expand that group and we're hoping to start a magazine, which I think we're already working on. Uh, soon we'll have a website as well. So we're still in that expansion phase. Um, but yeah, like I said, right now, we're just in the outreach phase, uh, hoping to um, spread the word to youth um, around the world, really, because this is an international organization. Um, and what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Um, so since since the, uh, the pandemic, we, we haven't been able to hold in-person events yet, but uh, we are hoping to hold monthly webinars. So um, our next webinar, as you see here, is on the scale of the universe. Um, we don't know what the future webinars will be, but we're hoping that um, eventually it won't be us, um, like the co-founders presenting as much as it will just be uh, youth who um, become, or just uh, youth from around the world presenting. Um, and we're, we're hoping that this will be less of a um, lecture uh, style in the future and will be more of a opportunity for anyone to present on uh, any or any youth to present on projects they've been working on. Same with the magazine. Uh, the magazine will be powered by submissions from youth around the world. Um, so yes, our goal as an organization, the Cosmic Generation, is to inspire the next generation of youth astronomers. Um, and that should be uh, beneficial in bringing in the next generation of rascals too, I should say. Hey, Nathan, <clears throat> excuse me, Nathan. Yes. I, um, I went to, I was thinking about the webinar on the, what was it, extraterrestrial life that happened? And I, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess maybe I, 
I didn't pursue it enough. I went to register and I pulled back when I saw that I was expected to put down a email address for a parent. Unfortunately, my parents had never even had computers. They might have just in their last year, but so I didn't pursue it. I presume though that anybody could have joined and I maybe missed out on that because it looked interesting from the top, yeah. the subject looked interesting. I think the setup that they established for the meeting was directed very much at youth, but I, I had a sign up form. Um, I, I, I realized that could be a problem. So I made a sign up form for this next meeting that just asks for an email, could be. Okay, yeah. good. So, so, so I couldn't have signed on the last time. If it was required, yeah. I think that that would. <laughs> that, would that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, I hope the, the way to inspire us, all these pre-cosmic generation, is to let us see what's happening there and to let our young, young friends who are definitely, and relatives who are definitely cosmic generation, know about it so you'll get more coming. So I hope that I, hope that I can attend some webinars that I'm... Uh, if they look interesting. Oh, yeah, of course, I can put the link for this uh, coming webinar in the chat if you'd like. Yeah, well, yeah. I've already I've already signed up, Nathan, and I had to put my age as over 20. <laughs> oh, oh. I will ask you to prove it, Lori. There you go. <laughs> just, just a day over, Lori, right? Just a, just a day. That's all. Well, we're all youth at heart, aren't we? We're all youth at heart. Exactly. exactly. As, as long as the material is age appropriate. And, and Dorothy, you should have just put Miles's email down and said he was your dad. Well, actually, that's a thought. I would just use somebody my, else's email. I started circling into the history, and my my brain started thinking about the history of emails. And I was just starting at the, to use email. It was just well, 1990 was basically when my my last parent died 91 so you know yeah i missed a bet so do you guys have any social media Nathan? um oh yes we're still also in the process of setting that up too i okay thought about starting an instagram um and and then nobody <laughs> Nobody submitted any other photos. So right now I have like two photos to put out and I'm hoping to have at least like a dozen before starting an Instagram. Hopefully I can get that set up in the next uh, few weeks, but um, yes. Yeah, and then you can use it to tag, right? And it just doesn't have to have anything on it and just have your poster and just tag a whole bunch of astronomy people, <laughs> like all the other social media people that are in astronomy. And they will share it. They will. And then you get all then, these old people just, crashing in on your group. <laughs> no, they 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 have children. <laughs> Sorry. No, don't you mean youth with decades of experience? Yes. So can we share it? Like I screen captured that poster. Oh yeah. Um, do you want me to show it again, or or you got it? I already got it. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, you're welcome to share it. The more people okay. you can get outreach to, the better. I have and, um, notes too. Sky News is also uh, hosting an article, and we're hoping to uh, get it in other magazines as well. So, uh, so yes, uh, the more people who can see it, the better. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. That's uh... That's great to see. Any further questions or comments? And yeah, maybe, uh, can we maybe post something on our website too? I guess it will be in the notes anyways, but uh, we can certainly. Sure, yeah. There's a little write up or whatever. Well, we submit that. Um, David Lee. Yes. Uh, okay. So um, I think I announced. Uh, quite a number of weeks ago about an upcoming lunar occultation, which is actually in the past now. And I'm happy to report that uh, I actually saw the disappearance and the reappearance. 
So I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown on that. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's there. Are you able to see, see the screen? Yeah. Okay, great. So I, I didn't really prepare the videos as well as I thought, or as fast as I thought I could. So I'm gonna actually show you the video clips uh, actually in the tool, like in Camtasia. So ho hopefully that'll be okay. Uh, so um, I did stay up that night uh, past the, um, the AGM and um, I, it, I, I just remembered it being extremely cold and uh, unbelievably, unbelievably windy. Um, I had originally thought that I was gonna drag out my, um, my GM8 and uh, use my larger scopes. Uh, but I, I thought, well, since it was so cold, I didn't want to bring it in and out of the driveway. Uh, so I decided to go really lightweight. So I took my lightweight rig. And in fact, I ended up using my, my uh, uh, mirrorless camera rather than one, one of the astro cameras that I had intended to use. And you'll actually see uh, the, the video clips are a little bit on the shaky side, but uh, you can definitely see the uh, uh, star uh, approaching the moon and then and then coming out of the moon. So I also uh, took the opportunity to uh, use my uh, ref small refractor. So I observed it as well. And again, I wish I had used something a little bit larger because uh, I did see them, but probably not at the magnification that I would have liked to. Have. So let me let me just minimize this and tell me if you can, as long as you can still see the. Can you see my Camtasia screen? I believe that's what that is. Yes, there it is. All right. So th this this is the entry. So this would have been around uh, two forty five. Um, actually, let me go back to the PowerPoint. So this is what you're going to be seeing. Um, this is the bright one. This is uh, Alpha Alpha Two Libre, and that's the bright star that's going to be in the clip. And then the uh, Alpha One Libre uh, is quite dim, and I'm going to try to. Uh, kind of boost the gain a little bit, just so you can see it. Okay, so you can actually see this uh, quite washed out because in order for me to see the, the star clearly, I had to uh, kind of overexpose the moon. Now, you can probably hear the, the, the wind. I don't know if it's uh, very apparent, but uh, it, it was quite noisy and a uh, little bit shaky, not, not dramatically, but uh, enough that I could actually observe. You can see it now. You can see the shakiness of the of the mount. But it was quite uh, quite cool to see it kind of hanging there just before the 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 edge of the moon. So I'm just going to stop this, and I'm going to turn on the other. I'm going to turn this guy off, and turn on the other tracks. So th this is the reappearance, and I took I took the audio out because uh, actually let me just uh... so you see there's a bit of a time stamp here. Now I've blown this out a little bit just so you can see see the star better, but this is a time three fifty two thirty four. So in approximately ten seconds after I start this, uh, look up in this corner here, and you should be able to see the star kind of blinking blinking into place. Oh, it comes pretty soon. Did you see it? So that's the first blink of it. And there you go. There you see it right there. Yeah, I wish I wish I had. Oh, now did you see this up here? That's Alpha One. Libre. This is Alpha 2. So you see the other, other one kind of blinking in and out. And then So this is about six minutes after, and I, I wanted to show you this because this is what the moon looked like um, uh, without it all blown out. So there's, there's actually this beautiful arc here. 
at the time when I was looking looking through the Terminator. It's just beautiful that night. And uh, there's Alpha Libre two, and Libre one is about there, but it's it's kind of hard to see. But you can I can barely see it on my screen. Okay, so uh, are there any questions? And actually, I'd love to hear uh, some of the other um, the other observations that people may have made. Well, it was kind of fun. There was about three of us emailing each other as it was happening. Uh, was it Sid and Nathan? Um, the eye has such an amazing dynamic range because there was no problem seeing the detail on the moon and those two stars without any trouble. And it's it, it's so surprising with the camera that you can only see one of those three things uh, at a time. You you don't you just don't have the dynamic range, and the eye is amazing. Yeah, and the other thing is that you kind of compensate for the fact that it's kind of shaky. The uh, the camera is very unforgiving in that respect. But I'm sure for you, uh, it was okay for a little bit of jostling happening. Yeah. Um, and the blinking was it, it was, it was very clear. I was I was much more blown um much more magnification i was doing 150 times with my six inch and nathan what were you watching it with uh i was watching it with my smaller telescope the refractor firstly because i watched it from inside because we conveniently have a uh, window that has no chromatic or visual aberration. Um, and that was the only telescope I could conveniently move around inside the house. <laughs> so I used that one and it still worked just as well. Cool. I watched it disappear as well. And I, like Nathan, I was inside looking through a window, so it wasn't the greatest view. And I was starting to get close to um, the extent of that I can actually see out that window. And then I was also starting to get into the top of a tree. So the moon was kind of moving as this tree was waving back and forth. And I was thinking, oh, great, I know what's going to happen. I'll end up with the moon right behind the tree at the critical moment. But no, I didn't. I did get to see it vanish. But well, I realized I, I, it wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to be able to see it reappear without going outside. So I decided I was going to chicken out. <laughs> so I I'll tell you my other comment, I'll, I'll tell you now, um, it, it was very, very weird because it was so windy and the, the gusts were so high. Uh, but you know, uh, just before each event, like just before the disappearance and just uh, in the reappearance, the skies just eerily parted for me. So I found that very odd <laughs> and cre almost creepy. Anyways, D Dave, you had a question or a comment. Oh, just the, the blinking was, due to the poor seeing right it That's, is absolutely. Yeah. absolutely the wind yeah. and everything yeah 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 absolutely from my vantage point there was a when it was vanishing there was a quite a bit of haze around the moon so i don't know if you were kind of lined up with that because that might have been a more localized cloud but it was, yeah yeah was it was it, 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 it was hazy it was not certain certainly not perfect conditions uh i wasn't using the equipment that i would have chosen uh, so everything was a little bit deprecated, but it was okay. It still worked. And I'm glad I just didn't not do it. I just did did with what I had. So. And as I said, I had the advantage of being inside, so I wasn't out in that wind either because it was, uh, it was, it was very of, cold. It was brisk out there. Yes, how very. <laughs> often, how often might we see a magnitude 2 star? Uh, well, actually, it's not, this particular star, Azubin el Kanubi, uh, is actually along the ecliptic. So this occurrence is quite common. I, I think uh, the last time this happened may have been only like a month and a half ago. Well, I highly but, encourage you to tell us when they come because that was that Well, was you know fun. the other thing, Randy, I think for you, I think my, you might be interested in grazes. Now, uh, lunar grazes are quite interesting because basically uh, a, a star will skim the edge of the moon and therefore sort of depict the profile of the lunar limb. Now that takes a certain exacting location. And of course, I mean, the chances of it being right here 
are become lower and lower because it has to be right at a particular point. But there's also uh, planetary occultations as well. So they kind of cool. Uh, well, that I'll let that you know. I do look for, like that we, we watched together the Mars one from King George Terrace a couple of years ago. Uh, I hadn't considered, I didn't know that doing a stellar occultation would be so entertaining, but it was. It was, yeah, absolutely. But I think it helped that that is quite a bright star, so certainly fine. It is, it is, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, not quite, I'm not quite so brave. I always pick bright stars or bright objects. Well, the conditions were, I would say, less than ideal. So if it had been too much dimmer, as you notice, you couldn't see the one that was, what's the other one, a mag five? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's that, almost, it, it basically, I once it got close to the moon, I couldn't see it anymore. Right. The um, background haze was brighter than mag five, I would say, yeah. or close to. And lunar occultations are listed in the Observer's Handbook uh, starting on page 165 for those interested. Yeah, that's there. right. That's right. That's Three true. Three pages of and, listings there. Yeah, I, and, and also also I'm pay attention to the <laughs> pay attention to the uh, the URL for IOTA as well, because IOTA shows all the bright occultations and the grazes as well. Yeah, well, thank yes. you for sharing thank what you thought and other people who managed to see it as well. Great, thanks. Lori, you wanted to have a few moments. So hi, everybody. I have got um, two things that I want to um, uh, tell you about or ask you, ask you about, basically. The first one is that um, uh, the Canadian Space Agency is um, going to be doing some promotion of the Artemis launch. Now, if, if anybody kind of kept up, uh, they, they, I think it was on Wednesday, um, Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, on Wednesday, they have pushed back the launch of the Artemis One program by a little bit. And uh, that's going to be coming up in April, I believe now. Uh, but the, um, the, just as the, as the Canadian Space Agency promoted the James Webb Telescope, and provided speakers and provided all kinds of promotional items and um, and uh, some uh, training videos and all kinds of things. They're doing the same thing for Artemis. And so what um, what we would like to do uh, the the Canadian Space Agency has um, asked for the help from the net from the national um, part of the Royal Astronomical Society to help with this promotion across Canada. And uh, so they've asked for uh, different centers to um, have uh, uh, programs that will um, that will provide um, the public to be able to to um, be part of the launch and get uh, get some information about it. And so um, the what what we were kind of looking at is that the our friends of the DAO are having a star party on uh, the on April the sixteenth. Uh, that's what we're that's what we're kind of going for right now and the april and what we would like is for there to be a a co-hosting uh so to speak of the RASC and the and the FDAO for a uh, a program that we would put on um for this and in fact today i uh put for i put through the um all the the, the form and everything that you have to do in order to get a, an astronaut or someone from the Canadian Space Agency to be the main speaker for that program. And I will know um, in, um, in a few weeks as to whether or not that will work. But, uh, but uh, so I've just, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that we can have uh, some, some good uh, promotion of that. Um, the, uh, uh, we can have a webinar um, we can do it via webinar, which means people can um, uh, can uh, sign up for that across Canada. It will be it will be promoted across Canada, and um, and different centers will also have other things. We won't be the only one, but uh, we certainly probably will will be the most Western one, and um, uh, and that we'll put it in newsletters and on our Facebook feeds, and we're hoping maybe that we can get some. Uh, some promotion as well at CBC or in the Times Colonist to 
um, be able to have a, a good a good group of people online um, for this. Um, I uh, we'll we'll see whether or not we can get it, but certainly even if we don't get um, a like an astronaut to actually come and speak to us, uh, we will get somebody from the space agency to come in and uh, do some work and do some promotion of the Artemis program. So that's kind of coming up on April the 16th. And I know that that, that is the Easter weekend, um, but, um, and, but not everybody is going to be totally away and not able to do it. So we're hoping that there will be enough people. And so we're, I'm, I'm asking for your support and, uh, and possibly um, uh, Malcolm uh, Scrimger, who's our new, uh, I mean, who's our, our person who does outreach Maybe Malcolm, you and I, with a number of other people, maybe we can get together to um, to do some work on that. So that's number one. Number two is um, for the annual general assembly, which is going to be held in uh, online again this year for the Royal Astronomical Society, uh, which is the 24th to the 27th of June. Uh, we're going to be having on the um, on on two on at least two of the nights we're not exactly sure it's going to be friday night and then saturday night sunday night and then uh some other things just on the month on the on the monday that we would like to have some virtual observing across the country um happening so that uh, that um you know if we were in person somewhere we'd probably go up to somebody's planetarium or we are uh, or observatory and we'd be doing some observing we want to do that um, uh, do that across Canada. Right now, we have we have people in Halifax, uh, in Montreal, in um, in uh, Edmonton. I think it's, I believe it's Edmonton. And um, and because of the time difference, um, I was wondering whether or not our our wonderful observers here with the Victoria Center uh, would like to do some solar observing because even um, at the time that we are doing this. Um, the, because it's so late uh, in June that it still will, the sun will still be up uh, by the time we are, you know, we're doing, um, you know, seven o'clock or eight o'clock observing it, and it's 10 o'clock there, uh, it still will be, it still will be sunny here. So um, I'm, um, I've been asked to kind of ask whether or not the, uh, the observing group here, there might be two or three or four people uh, maybe with the uh, the um, EAA group as well that would like to be part of that um, of that observing. Uh, we're not we're not exactly sure whether or not it will be one night or two nights, and we might actually just leave it open just because of of uh, <laughs> of weather and things like that. Who knows what's going to happen? But um, but that's 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 a request from the from the GA for the Victoria Center. And we're hoping that some that some people might be really uh, might help out with that. So uh, I can get back to some of the observing group people and ask whether or not uh, we could put our name forward for being one of the groups that would do it. Uh, we wouldn't have to be doing this all night long at all. It would be probably one like just one one section that we would be around. And then people from across Canada would be kind of just dipping into our feed in order to be able to see what we were looking at. So, okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Try not to sneeze here. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. Yes, so uh, people can get in touch with Lori um, as, uh, as they're able and um, interested in doing. Um, Dave, we're gonna be up next with the Edmonton photos. So you wanted to share something um, First, I believe from, was it from Sky News? Yeah, I, I just would like to draw your attention to, to an article in the latest issue of Sky News. My friend, Warren Finley, who's done a bunch of dark sky work with me in Edmonton, he wrote an article on doing what he's called bi marathons, which is combined Messier marathon and a running marathon in the same night. He's managed to do this twice, once in Edmonton and once in Australia, where he, uh, he breaks the uh, observing session up into, uh, into several sessions over the course of the evening, interspersed with running sessions. So you might be interested in seeing what he's doing. The next thing is from Abdar uh, Anwar. 
this is his progression still in amazing imaging. Uh, he's moved to Cochrane, which is a little bit west of Calgary. Uh, this is four hours and 18 minutes of data from his backyard. But he says it took him 20 hours of testing, calibrating, and processing to put it all together. He used a C11 at F2 with Hyperstar. He used an ASI 1600 camera with ZWL filters and a filter wheel on EQ6R mount with a 60 millimeter guide scope. Captured everything in Nina. And he says, uh, I think I managed to get pretty good at PixInsight after not sleeping for two days. Uh -huh. <laughs> so the first one is the full image. And then he has another image, which is a smaller portion of the image, which uh, shows more of the uh, hydrogen alpha regions and some of the star clusters that are in the, um, in the Andromeda galaxy. And then the next image that you're going to see is uh, he's, he, he reprocessed some of the stuff in the middle and he wanted to see if he could see the Kefet variable that Hubble used to do his first estimates of the Hubble constant. And by gum, there it is in his photograph. Uh, so if you go to the next one, it'll show, show the original Hubble plates. And if you look at the top right plate, there's a little red markings there that show where that image is. So uh, I think Hubble's telescope was originally a very large telescope, and he's doing it with an 11 inch, which is pretty amazing. Using Hubble used a 5.1 meter mirror. So not bad for an 11. The technology has really come a long way. Do you have any comments or questions for Dave? Um, okay, so Mike Webb, you sent me something. What was it? <laughs> was it? <laughs> was it? Do I have it here? Maybe you could, am I right there? Who, did, who sent it? It's just a single picture. Sorry, I finally got this thing booted back up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so let me see if I can. Oh, hold on a second. Let's see if I can. Share this here. So that was your uh, moon and the occultation? Yeah. Yeah. If, am I, uh, if you look to the right, uh, you can see that dot. And there is another one there on my screen. Yeah, so you got them both. Yeah, there's one. Well, if you look to the left, it's the same moon, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they're 48, they're 48 seconds apart. Um, I miss, I'm not sure if it exactly came out right at that time because I was holding a set of binoculars and I was holding a camera. And I, Mike, so, Mike, could you zoom in so I can have a closer look? Let's see. Yeah. All right. It's on my computer, so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, cool. No. That one or this one? Yeah, over there. That one, yeah. Yeah, that one turned out really well. Then. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. I don't know if it's nice or not. It was, I don't know why in the world I got up at that time that day, but I, I knew you had said it was coming and it must have kept me awake. Well, same reason I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just happened to wake up and say, oh, yeah, that's now. And it was about half an hour ahead. So I just thought, okay, I'm just going to sit here and read and, and watch the show. <laughs> hey, Mike, Mike, what was the camera that you were using? Uh, it's a Z6 Nikon with a 500 mil uh, F5.6. I'm not sure what I had it set at, but. Uh, yeah, so that's exactly the same camera I was using, except I was using only 300 millimeters. I had a 300 F4 on it. But notice that on Mike's picture, you did actually, the moon wasn't blown out and you could see the magnitude five star. So that that's absolutely amazing. Yeah, so the, the difference between the two is I caught mine from a video frame. It's not a, it's not a raw frame. So it's really already kind of deprecated actually. Right. That's, yeah, that's good would, that you caught it. 
I was just a little bit slow. Oh, of course, I didn't see it actually come out, but I was a little bit slow because I was using binoculars and then I had to put the camera against the uh, support to the deck. So it was really high tech stuff. Mike, Mike, was it windy where you were? Uh, no, our lower decks got a cover. Uh, there's an upper deck, a <laughs> lower deck, so it was pretty okay. quiet down there. No, I was, uh, I got a series and they're all pretty crisp for handheld and that, those kind of uh, parameters. So uh, oh, the timing good. is obviously wrong, but, but that's what was in the camera rather than what was there. So I was pretty happy with it, considering I don't usually get up at four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You, you have to have some uh, stories to tell, right? <laughs> I, yeah, there must be a different one. I actually <laughs> saw, I saw <laughs> The only other thing that was good was I don't I've only met our paper deliverer once before in <laughs> in the ten years we've been here, and I happened to run into him while I was doing that. So, and he's a nice guy. There <laughs> you go. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Well, thanks for sending that over. And sorry thanks. for trying to stop there. I don't know if you uh, knew I was going to try and do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Chris Gaming. Okay, just a second here. <clears throat> so what's up with web? Uh, two weeks ago, uh, I, I was uh, showing you these images, which were taken from the various uh, eight, 18 mirrors in the, uh, the segments of the big mirror and web. And uh, they, uh, they were still kind of spread all over the place. Um, and uh, uh, before they released the pictures, they did a lot of work to kind of figure out which image came from which mirror segment. Uh, I think, uh, 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 they, they took uh, different different images with the, the different segments and then uh, figured it out that way. So that was uh, that was uh, that came out shortly before our meeting two weeks ago. And uh, and this is uh, uh, these are a, a couple of uh, uh, images following the. Um, uh, the progress of getting everything lined up. You can see that they adjusted the mirrors. They have actuators on the back. And the one on the left uh, was their, their first go at it um, and uh, uh, lining them up. And then in the, the middle one, you can see they've done a little bit of work of focusing them, but not right in. And then in the, the one, uh, at the uh, at the right, sorry, um, is uh, now they have them pointed at the same spot. Uh, all eighteen are concentrated on that same spot, but they still have some work to do to, to kind of uh, get it focused. There's very very fine work that has to be done uh, so that you can get a kind of a single. Uh, image out of it, and and uh, it's uh, uh, it's going to uh, take a while. So this is uh, uh, this is just a, a, a screen thing I took off uh, a little while ago, showing where uh, where Web is at in its process. Uh, you know, starting with its launch back on Christmas Day, and uh, it'll take us all the way to. Uh, um, June sometime when we start getting uh, science quality images out of the telescope and where that big four is that's kind of where it's at right now. Um, above you can see the uh, the uh, 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 temperatures in the various uh, parts of the telescope and the, the cooling off is is uh, continuing. So that's um, 
I just uh, I uh, that's that's my little uh, update on web. Um, uh, just uh, just to follow up with uh, what Laurie was saying, uh, Artemis is, Artemis one uh, is is uh, now slated to fly in May, and it may not even make May. But in uh, on St. Patty's Day, I believe that's when Artemis is supposed to go out to the pad. So that will be an exciting milestone. And um, uh, and I'm waiting for the for the day when we get, uh, which will happen sometime in the next few months, the announcement of the Artemis II crew, which will be the first Artemis craft to have uh, humans on board. It will go around the moon. And um, uh, one member of that crew will be from the Canadian Astronaut Corps. So uh, uh, that's going to be an exciting announcement. Uh, on a less, uh, on a sadder note, um, uh, I've been keeping an eye on uh, the effects of the uh, uh, current war in Ukraine on, uh, or in Ukraine on various space programs. Um, basically, things on the International Space Station are continuing uh, as normal, but uh, the uh, uh, Russians have uh, have a can launch their Soyuz rockets from Kourou in French Guiana, where uh, JWST was launched. They've withdrawn their staff from there. Um, and uh, it looks like uh, it will affect the launch of uh, ExoMars, which is the um, uh, uh, European Space Agency um, uh, mission to do research on life on Mars. It was supposed to go up this this year uh, from from the Russian launch site at uh, Baikonur in Kazakhstan, uh, and I, I believe it had a Canadian, at least one Canadian instrument on board. And today, uh, uh, the uh, European Space Agency announced that that launch is unlikely to take place this year. So uh, it's, uh, it's it's starting to have some uh, real effects in in the uh, in the world of space. So uh, uh, that's basically uh, what's going on right now. Thanks, Chris. Any uh, comments, questions? So, Chris, um, this this conflict that's occurring right now. Is it uh, is it really hard to know if there's going to be any kind of lasting effects about participation? Well, we're just going to have to take things as they come along. You know, uh, it's you know it's uh, it, it it's hard to tell what the ultimate effect will be on things like the like the space station. Uh, uh, you know, if this drags on, it could certainly have effects. Uh, an interesting thing is that, uh, well, you know, part of the space station is Russian and, and part is essentially American. And, um, and uh, uh, at, least, at least at the moment, they can't kind of do without each other. Um, so it is possible uh, that, that if the economic sanctions continue, the Russians may choose to withdraw and shut down their, their portion. Uh, if this had happened a couple of years ago, it would have been much more uh, serious. Uh, but now the Americans uh, have the independent capability of, of uh, launching their, uh, their astronauts up and down on dragons, uh, which they didn't have a couple of years ago. Um, as well, uh, there was a spacecraft that was launched about a, a, a week ago called a, a Cygnus. There's been a whole series of Cygnus freighter spacecraft that, are, uh, that, that have been launched from the United States. Now, this, uh, this Cygnus spacecraft uh, just happened to be the first one that has the capability of boosting the orbit of the space station. And since the shuttle came back, that was a, exclusively a Russian thing. Uh, so anyway, um, 
and we'll we'll see we'll see if there there are other effects. You know, there are other joint programs, and uh, uh, Exo Mars is the first one. I mean, another thing that happened is there's this gigantic aircraft that the Ukrainians made called uh, Maria, uh, and it. It was used uh, a number of years ago to, uh, they put the Duran shuttle on top of it and used it to uh, uh, fly that around. And in recent years, it's become, been used for, to carry large loads of freight. For example, not that long ago, it brought, uh, I believe it brought some vaccines or supplies to uh, Canada, something to do with COVID. Well, uh, that aircraft, there was only one of them, and it was destroyed uh, over the weekend um, during the uh, during the war. So there's, you know, there are uh, there are things going on, and they aren't very good things. And we'll just have to see uh, how things go. And I see Peter has his hand up. Chris, I'm just wondering, do you know how much interaction there is? Uh, either with the hardware or even just with the personnel uh, on board the ISS. It always struck me as a little odd that there's a Russian side and a USA side. Could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, you know, I don't, I, I, I think there is, there is certainly uh, uh, you know, very regular daily interaction between them. Like they aren't, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, the station is big, but the habitable por portion is, it isn't that big. And I know they have the practice of, uh, of generally having at least one meal and maybe more together. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes it just makes sense for, you know, people from the one side to be working in the other side. Um, and there are a number of uh, protocols that, uh, that cover things like this. But basically what I have heard is, is that the operations on board the, on board the station are continuing uh, as normal. Um, that's, that's, that's the word right now. Uh, I, I would imagine that uh, you know there's been kind of a buildup to this event, and uh, um, you know, so I would imagine that uh, uh, people would have had a chance to uh, discuss this. I think it could get you know certainly more interesting as time goes on, uh, and uh, and once we get into things like. Uh, uh, spacecraft from various nations having to go up and down there's a guy on the one of the americans on the station i think what it, there's two russians uh, a german astronaut from the uh, european space agency and i think there are three americans right now i think that's that's the way it shakes down one of them is a guy named mark van de who's been up there for darn near a year i think he will break the record uh uh, for an American, anyway, up up on the station, and he's full. He's actually supposed to come back to Earth about a month from now on a Soyuz on the Soyuz spacecraft from Russia. And uh, when they come back, that involves you know an American aircraft, sort of like a Challenger jet, an executive jet comes in. To, well, actually, it's in Kazakhstan, but Kazakhstan is is allied with Russia. Uh, and and pick up the Amer any Americans that come back and then and fly back to Houston. So we'll see if if that's effective, you know, because you know uh, it could be a long month. <laughs> so anyway, we will see. And Dave has a question. And Dave, I see your hands up. Just just on the web pictures you were showing, the one on the right. Yeah. Now. That looked like the fact diffraction rings. I would, yeah, I, 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 I don't know what they are, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's what it is because, because there has to be a lot of work done to kind of get everything right to the same point. You know, there's, they're probably, uh, 
you know uh you know it's uh <laughs> yeah. not, not lined up or collimated or how, however you want to put it you know it's uh there's there's still a lot of work to be done okay or it could be the camera they're using for this alignment too but yeah uh, Chris, you don't have the details of how they're doing the alignment. Uh, are they doing it programmatically or doing it by eye? Uh, I honestly don't know that. I imagine, I imagine, uh, uh, I imagine it's up there, but I just uh, that that's a detail I haven't looked up. Yeah, I, I kind of, I, I, I think it would be hard to believe that they were doing it just visually. I'm sure they're using programs to do it. Yes, I, I would think so too. But yeah, I, I, I being human beings, I'm sure there's a, there's a little eyeball work there too. <laughs> yeah, my guess would be that they had a program to do it, but they're checking it. Yes. <laughs> are sure. the are the words phase retrieval appropriate to what they're doing in terms of alignment? Um, I don't know. Yeah, the words phase retrieval uh, come up on the uh, in terms of alignment, um, mm -hmm. but it's complicated. Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> yes, optics are uh, is an incredibly complicated thing. It's a, almost a dark art. Well, the good news is it looks like it's uh, what they've what they plan to do so far has worked. So that's, uh, that's right. Everything really seems to, see. to have worked properly up to now. And, and the Canadian uh, aspect of the uh, mission is working. The uh, fire yes, guidance they, system. I think I think I uh, that was at, at, at the last update that they had. Um, you know, the guidance sensors are working uh, correctly. Um, or the uh, fine guidance sensors, and and they turned on. Uh, which, which one is the Canadian one? Uh, the, it's nearest, I think. Um, nearest. Yes, they turned it on, and the thing runs. So. Oh. Very good. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, Bill. Yeah. So it's just a quick little thing. So this will probably be something that Lori will be interested in. So 10, 15 years ago, the club's 20 inch was rebuilt by Guy Walton to be a sort of a trust Dobsonian so it's more usable and that's what's up at the center of the universe for the outreach. Well, on the weekend, I came into the ownership of the equatorial tracking platform that goes with that telescope so that it will track now. So when, when it gets wheeled out, it can get placed on this track platform. So about every 30 minutes, it'll reset itself and have to be repointed, but it will mean that somebody won't have to keep every time somebody goes up and looks through this, the eyepiece, then the operator has to climb up and make sure that the object is back in the center of the field of view. It yeah, should Bill, just- mm -hmm. Bill, is, is this the original Ponset mount that, that uh... That, that he actually built? Yeah. Okay, I know the one. Okay, good, that's great. It's a, hu it's a huge structure. <laughs> it's, it's in my garage right now. Well, I remember him re resetting, resetting it, right? He would go to a certain uh, point and then he would have to turn, the motor would have to turn it all the way back. Yeah, but it does it. it does it automatically. There's just little switches at either end. So yeah. it goes, once it gets to the end and then it goes back. And so, yeah, that's that's available now. So that when the center is up and running, and that scope is out there. It'll be good for many people at a time to look through the eyepiece and won't have to be. Oh, wait, wait a second! Or somebody nudges it, you know, like, and then you'll still have to find it. But then you just get back down, and the person, next person, goes up. And you insist, don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, actually, with proper rigging, we probably could do. EAA with it as well, because it's going to track. It will track, yes. That would be a good yeah. experiment with it. Yeah, thanks for letting us know. So I guess we'll uh, have to arrange for it to be 
moved to its new locale one of these days. Yeah, once people are allowed up there. Yeah, very good. Great. And so apart from our little announcements at the end, uh, Randy, do you have a few words for us? Oh, I just wanted to say how much fun I had. We did a bit of everything. Talked about uh, planetary. We had uh, the Edmonton pictures of some galactic imaging. Lots of stuff about community with Nathan's uh, talk and the NASA news from Chris. What a great uh, range of all the things that uh, interest our community. So uh, kudos to this to this group. I love the organic nature of, of our Astro Cafes. Well, thank you. And so I think that's, um, if nobody else has anything, I think we're to David. You just wanted to tell us what's yeah. on this week. Yeah, right? so just, just a reminder, um, the beginners group or the getting started in an astronomy group is meeting tomorrow night at 7.30. So I think, uh, Lori, you and, you and Brenda have something on the Constellation Cancer tomorrow night? Uh, I think Lori's still there. So oh, anyways. I'm muted. <laughs> if, if, yeah, yeah. yeah, Brenda and I are there. Yeah. Oh, okay, excellent, excellent. And then um, on Thursday, uh, we have our EAA group. Now, uh, I've, I've, got a, I've got some news. Um, uh, Lori uh, put me in touch with uh, Karim, and there's a national uh, organization that, uh, a national committee that's actually looking into EAA uh, for our transition back to public outreach. So I just wanted to let people know a little bit more about the details of that. So on Thursday night, that's when we're going to talk about that. Great. Maybe you could let this group know kind of what, you know, when, when there's something more to share, I guess. If there is. Yeah, I, I think I think it's good. Uh, maybe Lori knows a little bit more uh, history about the Montreal group, but Kareem seems to be a bit of a driving force in terms of yeah. <laughs> uh, bringing everybody together. And this, this is certainly one of those things. And I, I got to meet um, all the other people that have been attempting to do EAA across uh, across Canada. So that was, it was just wonderful just to see what they've been doing. Excellent. Yes, I just wanted to say that, that uh, David was one of two people um, who had been asked to provide some information and a little bit of a presentation to get it going. We had about 30 people online um, mm. from everywhere across Canada with all the people doing, uh, doing uh, trying to do EAA and thinking about starting up the programs um, uh, for the public. And it was a really good session. And I just wanted to say to thank David um, for um, jumping in to that and that he has, uh, that he's, he, David is himself getting to be a little bit more known across Canada for some of the work that, uh, that he's doing here. So thanks David for doing well, that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I echo uh, Randy's comments. Thank you for everybody who shared this evening. It's been a, an interesting assortment of stuff and uh, um, we are planning to be back next week. And uh, as, as I said at the beginning, as we move closer to um, maybe having some in-person component to this, we'll uh, keep you posted and uh, as things come up, but uh, thank you for joining us this evening. And if there are no further comments, I'll wish everybody well and see you here next week. Thanks everybody. Yeah, thanks for hosting, Chris.